everyone um, to our panel discussion. Um, I know this probably will not achieve its desired effect, but I would love for more of you to move closer to the front of the room. I don't think anyone always says this, no one ever does it. Um, but it is, thank you, Shax. Um, please do come forward, because this is a, this is a small and intimate group, so, so might as well around one. So welcome everyone. Our topic for this discussion is impact investing in Asia, which is a CTB broad topic when I was given it. Um, all I have to say though is that it's a narrow topic of this morning's plenary discussion, which was impact investing in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So I think we're doing quite well. Um, the subtitle though I think gives it a bit of a, uh, an added focus, which is from promise to, to realization. Um, I would put it to all of us that at the moment it's still mostly about promise uh, and not quite yet about realization, so we should talk about that a bit more today. Um, as you all know, Asia is a pretty big place um, and we have a pretty diverse panel here today to discuss that. Um, so we have Ross Baird um, from Lomelet, who is from British Capital, um, most of you will know do. Um, they have recently started programs uh, in Mumbai and also in China, in Shanghai and Beijing. Um, so we're going to hear from Ross on that. Uh, we also have Nilo Kenny, who is the CFO of Ashka. Um, again, he's an introduction, you know, that's seasoned and that's professional here based here in Mumbai. We also have Sonet Tresser from Change Fusion, um, who some of you will know. They're the really spearheading the social innovation agenda in, in Thailand. Also, um, from Asia Community Ventures, which is a new advisory practice based in Hong Kong, the uh, Philo Southern from the Philippines. Uh, and I'm Mark Ho, I'm from Honest Deloitte, I believe the Business Markets Unit that's based here in Mumbai. Uh, I'm from Malaysia, born to children of Chinese immigrants. So I think we've got a pretty uh, diverse group here, you know, so that should help us cover this broad expanse which we call, which we call Asia. So before we dive in, some slides to try Oh yes, that's it. That's my. Uh, you know, we've, we've kind of laid the lines and sown the seeds and waiting for the first green shoot. We've not seen the fruit yet. So it's mainly about promise still, I think, not uh, not realization. Asia, good place. Some of you would have seen this. So Jin and JP Morgan did a survey at the end of last year. This is the second year they've been doing it, surveying impact investors. This time we spoke to 99 investors around the world and spoke about what they're trying to invest in, what their expectations were, and all that. And one of the questions they asked was, where are you planning to invest? And about a third of the investors said that they were going to invest in South Asia. And about the same amount again said, uh, about similar numbers said they would be investing. And Southeast Asia. So obviously, the two regions are pretty significant from a global impact investing point of view. I think that for most people here at Sankal, the South Asia bit will not be too surprising. Uh, the East and Southeast Asia bit might be a bit surprising, especially for those listening to think this is, this is the center of impact investing, which it is to some extent, but there's a lot of interest in East and Southeast Asia as well. And I think it is kind of surprising because sometimes we think, well, you know, in terms of need, South Asia's got such a great need than East and Southeast Asia, so it also has so much activity here. But I think I would remind us all that you know, whilst there is a lot of poverty in South Asia, we still have very high levels of need in East Asia. So we know that uh, two thirds of people live in poverty in, in South Asia, but in China, which has seen tremendous growth, um, still about a third of people live in poverty. Very multiplied through by the people, that's a lot of need. I think as we'll hear today, there's also a lot of exciting activity happening on the ground in East and Southeast Asia, so we'd like to spend some time on that too. So, let me just dive in. Um, my first question really is um, to help us understand who's on the panel. So, my first question to the panel is really, you know, where do you work? What sort of impact are you interested in personally to your work? And how do you work to, to achieve that? 
across the sun. Are we on? Okay. Uh, my name is Ross here. I run an organization called Village Capital. Uh, we work globally. We work with partners around the world to, uh, to operate business acceleration programs for pretty early stage ventures, very interested in ventures that are post revenue and some sort of thing that somebody is buying. Um, but typically have to raise any outside funding before they, they go through a program that are looking to be high growth to the point where they're trying to raise equity one day. Um, impact wise, we are really interested in two things. Um, one is affordable basic services for the poor where um, the revenue generated by the good or service is linked to the impact. So everything in our portfolio is everything from a company called Simba Networks. I think many of you may, may know that uh, sells uh, a finance mechanism for home energy systems. So you can pay per minute if you're buying a home solar energy system uh, via the Simba unit. You can pay per minute and essentially lease to own this energy system over time. It's, um, their, you know, Simba's impact is providing access to energy to families. Their revenue model is selling systems that provide access to energy to families, and that's it's pretty straightforward. And the other for us is energy slash environmental sustainability, which in China and Southeast Asia, we're really seeing a ton of very exciting things. Um, I would say it is a core area of focus for us. We've run uh, four programs here. We just launched a program last week with uh, CIIE at IIM Ahmedabad. Um, we have 15 new ventures. Um, other places in Asia, we've done one experimental program in China. It's a national program. Um, but we're interested in several other countries in, in Southeast Asia as well. So. Um, we're really coming at this from a, from a very experimental viewpoint. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Vidal Kane, and I work with Abhishekar. People here in the room, probably almost everybody knows about Abhishekar. Abhishekar was uh, the pioneer in what's called as impact investments. We started this out in 2001. And, uh, we strongly believe that enterprise-based development, which is essentially using businesses to solve you know, social problems, social challenges, uh, is a very critical element and it actually provides far measurable impact. Uh, what we typically do is we are an early stage fund. We manage about 140 million dollars across four funds, and we invest typically in sectors which have the kind of uh, opportunities for us to invest in healthcare, education water of sanitation and businesses. And we typically look for not only near commercial returns, but also measurable impact. And we look at all, all our organizations, all our investment deals, to those two factors. One is sustainability, commercial returns, scalability, as well as impact. And, and, and we are now looking at taking our investment model and what we have done so far and our experiences and trying to see if we can leverage that and take that to geographies in South Southeast Asia which are sort of similar to India demographically, culturally and also have an active entrepreneurial ecosystem but also have the same kind of developmental challenges that India faced a few years ago. Um, uh, I'm from Thailand, uh, in Fusion. Uh, what kind of impact are you interested in? In recovery. <laughs> so we are, we are, we are actually, uh, and our mission is actually to grow the social entrepreneurs so that they can hopefully change the world um, and be sustainable. Um, I think, uh, and we have different mechanisms, you know, we, we have both venture philanthropy type work, we have impact investment kind of work, and also a lot, a lot of business development work. So basically, we, we, I think in South Asia, we have both uh, kind of impact category. One is more traditional impact, like at the bottom of the pyramid, like you know, water issues, uh, livelihood, and, and, and poverty, and so on. So within that, we work in kind of uh, support social enterprise working on agriculture, uh, sustainable agriculture, um, uh, different kind of uh, poverty focused uh, enterprises. Um, but also in, in South Asia, we have a lot of problem in the urban area, uh, all more like broader issues. Like in Thailand, we have, we are one of the highest rate of teenage pregnancy. 
Like every year, like 100, 120,000 students kind of got pregnant and kind of keep themselves or got kicked out of school in a year in Thailand. So our teams are very active in that research. Uh, um, so, you know, like in song in that kind of thing, we, we work support social enterprises that actually make movies. For example, they, they use these teenage pregnancy issues and create a movie out of it. It's like a teen movie. Uh, actually, they got ideas from the U.S. Uh, as a media, which made this kind of movie, you know, in front of the intros of all the way, normal movies. So, uh, so, so, you know, they made that kind of movie, and, and you know, it was well received. I think initially, as investor and supporter, we, we were pretty sure we were going to go back up. But, but actually, they, they sold like 100,000 something tickets uh, and get you these uh, kind of deals and so on. So, so it kind of went through. And, so it's very, very broad. Normally, all like you know, uh, we support social enterprise working on mobile and, and uh, web apps uh, that, that get into health applications, quantify itself, and you know, like how you run and you get your numbers and how you solve the health problem yourself, that kind of thing. Um, also, but but you know, these kind of enterprise have a second impact category, have a gigantic problem attracting. Uh, traditional impact investor, especially regional or global one, because they will feel that um, you know it's very weird stuff and how we measure the impact and so on. So, but but we are much more open. Um, so I I hope to give that. Do you want to say a bit more about what you what you guys do for these enterprises? Just because I'm thinking it might be less familiar to you. Okay. Uh, so basically, we we are more like partner. To the, to, the, to the social enterprises. So first we work with them on, on the business plan. Uh, so maybe a little bit like similar to Asia. So from business plan, and then really see what they need, and then we have to do financial mechanisms in the case investment, and then philanthropy, if we get into them, connect them to, to the investor or supporters. Um, then we sometimes work on helping them access the market, like um, become like a trust broker to different operations or some people or some foundations that have their first group of clients. So, so we actually help them very hands-on in, in the process. Um, and yeah, I think that's really what, what we do. And I think lastly what we do mean also is more like sector building. For example, when we work with few sustainable agriculture enterprises, we certainly see that they all have similar problems, like working capital, they need retail partnership and so on. So then we start creating like small meetings, you know, like uh, kind of meeting, uh, bring different potential partners together from a corporation to few other people that can collectively solve this uh, kind of more like sector specific issues. So, so basically, whatever that needed to be the work. All right. My name is Philo uh, Alto, and I'm the co founder of Asia Community Ventures. Uh, we're based in Hong Kong, and what we do is we focus on uh, promoting collaboration across the different sub-sectors within Hong Kong, and uh, more broadly across Asia in terms of uh, collaboration, sharing across the different uh, countries as to what can we learn from a success perspective, what can we learn from a failure perspective, what can we learn from a transformational change perspective. Uh, in terms of why we started this, is that effectively, uh, I'm an ex investment banker and originally from the Philippines, I was born in Taiwan, now Hong Kong is home. I see the huge disconnect between the people who are, have with the sources of funds, institutional funders, family offices, donors, what have you, uh, relative to those organizations, which uh, can be called social purpose organizations, who are either nonprofits or social enterprises. They sort of uh, speak different language, they measure their success quite differently. And so Asia Community Ventures was born as a result of trying to, like, trying to break this institutional and cultural and language silos so that they can start talking about the same things and at some point they can start measuring success about how they address the social impact uh, towards, you know, uh, towards their respective goals and also appropriate to their uh, risk profiles, what have you. Now, in terms of our intended impact, we have just uh, finished a uh, impact investing forum last month, 
uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation, and uh, Harvey was in fact our moderator for the uh, for the entire day. But the idea here is that uh, we uh, basically launched an impact economy innovation fund uh, for East and Southeast Asia to promote precisely what I just mentioned earlier, which is the collective impact and the market development across the ecosystem, of which impact investors and social enterprises are uh, a part. And so this channel plan actually uh, uh, is 400,000 US dollars. It's not big, it's not small. And it's targeted to, uh, uh, to grant about three to four proposals to support the space, which I will get on uh, a bit further. So those are the two things, and I think one of the other things that I'll be happy to share uh, in a, a bit more detail about the dynamics across uh, East Asia as well as Southeast Asia, because even though it seems like East Asia and Southeast Asia seems to be quite far removed from India, there are huge opportunities for learning uh, both uh, both sides. And this is one thing I'd like to discuss a little later. Thank you, thank you. Um, right, so. Uh, Philo, you've given me the perfect segue into uh, the next, uh, next couple of slides. So my next question for the panelists here to be on what they see as the political challenges for impact investing in the specific spheres they're working in. Um, just to kind of lay a little bit of uh, background here for that, uh, as Philo said, Rockefeller's just been doing these series of meetings around the world on what is happening in impact investing in different regions. And also launching the ground fund. Um, so there's been one of the East and Southeast Asia, which has been launched in Hong Kong. Um, some of you will know as well that it's been launched in India. In fact, I think it's closed now in, in India, uh, done in partnership with Vinyard and, and Astra. Here, again, the meeting bank was at each of these launches, rather than it's a meeting where they brought a whole bunch of practitioners and investors and entrepreneurs together and said, let's talk about what the challenges are that we're facing. Um, and before each of those sessions, a bit of a survey, um, and they ask people, what do you think are the key challenges facing the sector today uh, across four different buckets? And these were the four. So, um, a lot of capital, strengthening demand, um, so actually, enterprise actually able to absorb capital, assessing impact, um, and improving the enabling environment, which can probably catch up everything else uh, that you need to work on. And this was the, these were the results of, of the India survey. So each is a, a firm, which basically people had to kind of distribute votes across 100, across all four departments. Now, what's interesting is this is India. Basically, everything is a problem, right? Everything is a challenge. It's not like everything's not a challenge. Um, but also, what's interesting is when you did Southeast Asia and East Asia, it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so, this is. Part of what makes you think actually it is still you know, a very, very young sector. We have lots and lots of challenges. It's a long way from realization because we're, we're running to the same types of barriers everywhere. Everything is a problem. Everything is a problem. Everywhere. Um, so, on that note, I'm going to ask the panelists what they would say um, you know, in any one of these markets, or maybe across the markets, you don't have to choose necessarily because it's a problem. But what do you feel most acutely in terms of the challenge facing your work? Um, you know, the top one or two. And, uh, and if you could give us some examples and stories about you know, how you encountered those in your work, uh, that would be very helpful. Start in the middle, let's Just, just to get a sense of the audience, how many of you are entrepreneurs starting your own venture? How many of you are, how many of you are investors uh, looking to invest in things? How many of you are ecosystem players uh, working in some sort of enabling or intermediary organization? How many of you don't know? What? Policy makers, yes. Okay. I'm, we are coming from an area where we do two things. We, we source and then provide a program that provides value to entrepreneurs on one side, and we also uh, 
raise money that we then invest on the other side. So um, we're, we're kind of in the middle. So I would say the two challenges we see are one, um, the people get very excited about the idea of impact investing. And I think particularly people who are new to the, the, the concept. And then when you show them examples of enterprises, they either get very, very excited, um, which is unusual, or they say, oh, none of those are actually that good of, good of companies, which is, I think, a lot more. Uh, those are way messier, those are way earlier stage. Um, and I think that we we see, we have, we have a term that we talk about, uh, we say like, there are social enterprises that have never heard of social entrepreneurship. There are great ventures who are out there making an impact. They've not necessarily heard the term, and they, they, we, they're actually very quality companies. But I think that the um, whatever it is, the investment firms, the intermediary, intermediaries are. You have to go out and recruit those companies. Like these are tinkers in their basement with a very interesting disruptive technology that might have sold to a bit. They're, they're not out there looking for impact investors because they don't know that impact investors exist. So I think um, there is a kind of build it and they will come approach, particularly in less developed areas, uh, to impact investing social enterprise that doesn't quite recognize that it takes a lot of work to source and originate um, really good companies. I and mean, this is why Avishkar, I think, is a gold standard reputation. You guys have spent a lot of money and time on, on sourcing. Um, and so I think that is one big bottleneck, quality sources. And there's there's no way to make it any easier than just spending lots of, of time sourcing and there's stuff there. Was there, there anything distinctive about the China or any of the experiences that you've had you know, with the experimental programs in those two countries versus yeah, so we originally said we were running a program and making investments in social enterprises. In China, we couldn't find a good translation for social enterprise. China was really interesting, actually. So we just brass tacks talked about we we're looking at entrepreneurs in health, energy, education, water, didn't even get into the social impact things. We didn't know how to translate the language. We got 1,100 applications to our program compared to 44 applications to the previous India program um, where we were looking for self-identified social enterprise. We then took the China recruitment language and theme to our most recent India program. We got over 400 applications. And I think that we, it's, it's on the people in the sector to make what we are doing accessible to really great entrepreneurs who might not use the same Lingo in China, it was it was unbelievable. I mean, eleven hundred. Most of them were not that good, but we we got we got fifteen really great ones out of it. Yeah, that's impressive. Um, I think you know you really kind of know that because uh, the, the, the language point really resonates with something you said yesterday. Actually, actually, I wanted to um, add on this point about the China part, and part of the like, I mean, let me go back to the there were four buckets that we talked about. And where Asia can I just focus on is we have uh, two aspects which right uh was quite smack in the top priorities. One is the enabling environment, and number two is unlocking, unlocking capital. The China bit is interesting because when you convert social enterprise in Chinese, the term charity comes in, helping out. Meaning automatically the entrepreneurs think that oh this is not gonna work, this is not gonna be financially sustainable because this is just talking about people. So from a China perspective, even Hong Kong or Taiwan for that matter, people are off put by put off by uh, by this and so sometimes they're doing a lot of stuff that is meaningful to their communities, but they don't even self declare themselves as social entrepreneurs. So we are entrepreneurs. We are here to make money, but of course, our clients are uh, our basically people who need our services, and we have to be at the base of the pyramid. So that's a contextual difference in, uh, in China. That's number one. Um, as it relates to the four keys, I would caveat this to say that my understanding is a bit more East Asia and also some of the Philippines, because I'm origin from the Philippines. But while all four are problems, no one size fits all uh, problem of price to each country. In other words, each country is very unique uh, in terms of their specific dynamics. But one thing that's relevant as it relates to the promise and the flip 
said promised the pipe is that everyone hears about impact investing as a term that it's been around for about six years now, that everyone gets excited about it. Entrepreneurs say, oh, I need to do something good. I'll wear my t-shirt called impact investing. And investors, please come to me and really need this stuff. When they meet with the investors, finally, after knocking the door, stand next to one of the banks and the say, so what do you do? What are you trying to say? Uh, I want to say social pressure. The investors say, so are you going to return my money and invest in you? I know that you have a social return. Uh, you're asking the wrong person. In other words, there is a social, the, the, the definition of term is a major issue that is actually hindering. It helped the space for the first five years, because people know that the intended social impact is useful. People try to do good things as an intention. But five years down the road now, people more or less in the know, people who are attending the Sankal Forum, the Global Social Venture Competition, what have you, the dialogue is more how do we move this forward? And I would say that based on what I've seen so far in terms of uh, the people who worked it, based in Hong Kong, where there's a lot of mainstream investors who really are curious about the space, who want to contribute, but they say, where are the deals? We cannot find the deals. And whenever I hear that word, there's an element of hubris, there's an element of lack of understanding of what's out there, what social entrepreneurs are facing day in and day out as they serve their organization. So one of the things we're trying to do through the work is working with government, how can government have policies that will be understandable to charities and those social enterprises, as well as to impact investors, institutional funds, as a social enterprise scales up from the one stop, one, one person then, to that of impact investment already. So the enabling environment is a very uh, important thing that we have worked on. The second one is for unlocking capital. Because I am based in Hong Kong, I don't have the bandwidth to fly to Philippines, Cambodia, Thailand, or what have you. Nor do people who are doing really good work in India and China and so on and so forth. But the reality of the matter is, it is a lot of work. It is hard work to do due diligence. It is hard work to find reputable um, uh, social entrepreneurs. It is hard work to measure impact, all of this stuff. So therefore, what is needed right now is more intermediaries towards supporting the space so that we can share resources, share expertise, share ideas. And these are the two specific gaps that I'd like to uh, focus on. I'll stop there for now. Uh, the other two I can actually uh, address by specific uh, you know, examples. Thanks. So, Felix, do you want to say something about, say something more about the Philippines? Um, you know, I think it's an interesting market which maybe up until a year ago, I wasn't really on my radar, and there's a lot of stuff happening in the Philippines which people may not know about. If you could give people a quick sketch of what's happening there. Yeah, Philippines is very interesting. I just got back a few weeks ago uh, from the Philippines. Uh, the social entrepreneurship uh, environment there is actually very vibrant. I would say that it's uh, behind uh, India, but way ahead of uh, a few other countries. Uh, of course, uh, Thailand, uh, Sindhu can uh, comment on that. But the, what's happening there is that when I was sharing with them what Asian Community Adventures does, and there was an opportunity to get unlock funding from serious mainstream money into the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries, uh, they, the person who I spoke with was a partner, a uh, Prince and Young, he said, uh, Philo, let me stop you there for now. The reality is that we have a lot of money within the Philippines that can support social enterprises and, so, and uh, address social issues. What we do need from their perspective is a lot of social enterprise, they're so, and social entrepreneurs, they're so energetic, so passionate, and they, because poverty issues, energy, environment, all of those are first sight of visuals for them. It's a day to day reality. How in Hong Kong we read about it in the papers, what have you, so it's a slightly similar. But from their perspective, they don't have enough role models. They don't know that if they scale up their impact, from 100 communities to 1,000, 10,000, at some point, they will run out of tycoons who will be funding them. And so what they're asking for uh, from a Hong Kong and Singapore perspective is, where are the funders?
extending actually help us out. And uh, from my perspective, when I share with them, hey, just because you are doing a lot of good things, a lot of founders, once they do meet with you, they will realize that you still don't have proper IT, you still don't have proper corporate governance, you don't have a risk management of process in place. This will take time. And that's why, as part of my work, uh, Asia Community Finance work, it's more a mutual learning between the social finance hubs, Hong Kong, Singapore, what have you, with Southeast Asia, India, so that we can learn from people on the ground and organizations that are actually doing a lot of good work, who has a first well, line of sight, visuals as to what's happening at the grassroots level, have that dialogue so that one to scale, and you're at one point in the future, five years, ten years from now, you're impact investment ready, then investors will also come in. But investors themselves also have an obligation. We always say that you need to be humble. You need to know what is the reality of the ground. Don't just say where are the deals, I'll wait for the deals, and then afterwards, uh, you guys uh, are not doing a good job. And we always ask investors, please go to the countries, please really understand the social issues that these entrepreneurs are doing. So that once this mutual learning is in place, by the time that actual investment is there, both are speaking the same language, both are expecting the same thing. Not just simply saying that, I'll wait for you, wait for you, you know, uh, this is actually nonsense. No, actually, there's a lot of humility and cross-sector learning that needs to be done. So the intermediary is coming again. So uh, let me comment on some of the, um, the, uh, the issues that were addressed. And having sort of started looking at Southeast Asia and South Asia a lot more seriously beyond India's borders, um, what, I've, what we have found is uh, al almost all these countries sort of mimic India demographically as well as culturally. And I'm not making a blanket statement. There are exceptions to that, of course. Uh, and then a lot of them also mimic India in terms of entrepreneurial activity. And, and for, for funders like Avishkar, for impact investment funds, uh, what we also have to realize, and I think you know, people here in, in the room also un, un understand that and realize is that we ultimately are raising capital from other commercial sources as well as philanthropic organizations. And they are expecting us to return the capital back to them with some return. Yeah, they may not necessarily look for commercial returns, but they are looking for us to return it back with some returns. But what's important is to combine that with impact. And that's measurable impact that we can actually demonstrate. And I think a lot of those are, are, are experiences of what Avishkar and other impact funds have sort of already got in India. And being able to take that as a platform to other parts of the world, primarily South and Southeast Asia, which are very close which are culturally the same, which sort of almost mimic India's entrepreneurial uh, ambitions. Having said all of that, I think you always have this dilemma. I mean, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And, and do you take capital and then essentially wait for entrepreneurs to turn around and say, I have capital, so I'll start doing this? Or do you go out there and say, I'll only go when I have capital? I mean, I have entrepreneurs, and then I'll start looking for entrepreneurs. I think what is really important is to understand that Venture investing can't be this very quick in, let me find a you know, few companies to invest in interesting business models or interesting entrepreneurs and then get out. A lot of it has to be patient investment. A lot of it also means having a lot of intense engagement with the entrepreneurs and the businesses, helping them scale up. Because unless you make them, you know, unless you scale them up and make them sustainable, long term there's not going to be any sustainable impact. And that's very critical for, for enterprises, investors, to also sort of keep in mind when we start going out and starting to look at investments in South and Southeast Asia. Um, I think for me, I, oh, the, the question is that it did come to me because the word impact, you're saying there was a problem with impact investment, for example, in Thailand. The problem is it's not my land. <laughs> so, um, but it doesn't but exist. Said, it doesn't mean, exist. Yeah. 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 You have it, guys. But I mean, there's a growing group of people, uh, companies, and foundations who are getting into this, as in many other countries. 
But I think uh, what worries me a bit is that this new era and so on, right? Suddenly all these bigger guys, you know, big company, family offices get excited, which, which is great. But then they read, all read the same report, JP Morgan, or the report, right? And so suddenly they, they, they thought of this as a very professionalized things that they can do. Suddenly a lot of people who used to be very, very focused on a customer, you know, like, I mean, I think the big problem they had in West is that they kind of lose focus on, on this ultimate customer, which is the companies. Right, so when you're not customer focused, when you're not obsessed with build, kind of solving the problem of the I mean, main needs of your, your customer, which is entrepreneurs, then um, you know you got stuck in different things. You know, you set up funds that that didn't kind of reflect what is needed in the market, and you got stuck in the fund structure of which you know you can't move much. And, and then we are hearing more and more of people setting up funds in, in, in Southeast Asia. That's always been a hard place in Asia, whereby they think like, ah, oh, they can't find any deals, you know, or like investment ready deals. But, but you know, if you look at what do they mean by deals, it's like, okay, you need a certain amount of things, which is not like that in the first place. So, so I think in that sense, um, if we somehow can bring impact investment back and kind of recalibrate it a bit to the real needs on the ground, that might be useful. Um, I'm seeing like two layers of activities going on. First is like this more like bubble of impact investment interest in South in Southeast Asia or in Asia. That uh, you know a lot of people are joining me more and more conferences, setting up different funds or structures or you know like whatever. Um, and, and those are in a way activities and and so on. But but another layer of activities actually what impact investment is supposed to do, which is delivers financial solutions, especially innovative financial solutions to, to your target uh, entrepreneurs, you know. It, it's not really happening very fast. So I think if we can somehow keep the fundamental and the, 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 the bubble kind of in check, it might work uh, better. I think that's kind of a thing that, that uh, I think might be a bit of a problem now. But um, I'm happy, right? I think if you look at the history, right, of any bubble, right, like for high tech stuff to really grow, um, or like the internet to really grow, you need some kind of bubble and you need burst. You know, over investment into something would would only way to allow some real thing to grow. But of course, sometimes the high go bust too quickly and nothing happens. So, like sucks. But you yeah, know. the side of the bubble yeah. when it bursts. I want to I want to talk about one thing that. Uh, Sinit said that I might uh, respectfully disagree with, and I think that this is something that that I see a lot of people getting stuck on, um, and that's entrepreneur as customer versus investor as customer. Um, who, who, audience question, um, who is Google's customer? Shout it out. Yeah, I'm in. Who's Google's customer? No. How does Google how does Google make their money? Advertisers. And I think this is a really fundamental breakdown. We are the beneficiaries of Google. We get all get whatever we want in the world from Google, but how Google actually makes money is is serving us so well, making us so happy that we keep coming back and keep giving them more data and keep giving them more touch points so that advertisers will pay Google to have access to us. And I I think that there is a breakdown in the entrepreneur as customer versus investor as customer. I think there are a lot of great organizations that serve entrepreneurs incredibly well. And then they go to people and say, oh, hey, you have money. We have really interesting things. You should invest your money in our things. And Vinod comes and he mentors our things. Like, These are really cool guys. But you know, my LPs, this, is, this doesn't fit their mandate. And no amount of sweet talking will convince Vinod to go against what his LPs want because his LPs are his customers. And so a lot of what's going on in the intermediary work is designed entrepreneur as customer. This is this is not to say, this is to say that this is not to say you shouldn't serve the entrepreneurs. If Google didn't make all of us very happy, Google would not be a multi-billion-dollar company. Um, but if what you're trying to do is facilitate impact investment, figuring out what investor as customer wants and designing your services for entrepreneurs so that your customer is so happy that they will pay for the privilege of being involved in 
these these great companies, I think you're I think you're on the right track. I don't know. That's a big breakdown I've been seeing. So, so one of the questions that raises is whether the expectations for the investors that we're serving are in line. You know, so I think that's are in line with what we're seeing on the ground, right? So, do we think, to Sunit's point, that there is a bubble building where these things are kind of drifting out of line? Uh, there's there's definitely a lot more interest in, in this in, in what we call as a so-called impact investment space at least in the last couple of years ever since I, I sort of got into this business uh, having said that I also see that there's a lot of interest of impact investors wanting to go into Africa Southeast Asia and since we are now talking about Southeast Asia we'll try and talk about you know Southeast Asia there there is a lot of interest but is that a is that a bubble? Is I think a little too premature and a little too early at this point, uh, because it's almost it's almost virgin territory at this time. Uh, there's a lot of money sloshing around private equity venture for mainstream enterprises, and and that's all typically private equity, and, and these are all looking at big ticket items. Now impact and early stage is typically looking at early stage with smaller ticket sizes, smaller investments, and also sort of working fairly intensively with the businesses to scale them up. And I think there, there is still not a bubble and I think it will take some time for that to build up. But I think as, as more and more capital, you know, what does capital do? Capital is only looking for the most efficient place where it can be deployed so it, it can actually have a, a, a fairly decent return. I mean, I, I realize that, you know, so impact investment could also sort of be termed as, is it philanthropy? Am I just, you know, going ahead and providing grants? But that stops at some particular point, and then you end up saying, well, there's no impact after that. Because once it stops, impact also stops. But if you have capital, which is commercial capital, or even capital that's looking for decent returns, which is what impact investors and, and our LPs, our institutional LPs, are always looking for, I think from that perspective, as and when, as the entrepreneurial activity builds up and, and as and when more and more entrepreneurs start realizing that there are all these opportunities, because entrepreneurs are not only looking at all of this as purely as impact. They're always saying, I know there is impact, I know I can, I can go out and, 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 and there, is a, there is water shortage, but I also know that if I sell this, I can make some money out of it. So commercial aspects combined with impact is, is what an entrepreneur is looking at. And, and as more capital flows in, more entrepreneurs start realizing that there's an opportunity for them to start these enterprises. I think you'll always find ways for, especially early stage and growth stage capital, to be able to be deployed in these geographies without necessarily creating a bubble, at least in the short run. I just want to say that um, if you have a hammer and that's the only tool that you have, everything in the world looks like nails. Therefore, my point here is that uh, in a way there is a bubble in terms of it is the, it's the, it's the new thing uh, where, where microfinance was a few decades ago. And so because everyone focuses on that, there's a lot of attention to what are the things I can, uh, here are my nails, please use the hammer and hit my nail. The reality, let me give some statistics. Uh, I did a research a few years ago, it's on my website as well, uh, which is called the um, Impact Investing Will Hype Solids Emergence and Asset Tests. Uh, the bottom line of that is that I uh, did a study wherein Acumen Fund, uh, they have invested 70 million US dollars over 10 years, and uh, that 70 million dollars comprised only 1% of all the deals that they have sourced, number one. LGBTQ, which is a venture that the organization which also does impact investing, they have looked at over the span of their fund uh, 5,000 deals. And these are not unsolicited deals, these are deals that are referred to them. They've invested in 62 of them as of, I think, uh, a year ago. So probably right now about 100. So that's 1%. Now, I don't know whether this 1% is a magic number or not, but the reality is that if the serious players, I'm curious to hear what the uh, average first number is as well, but if the serious players are invested in just 1% of all of the deals that are presented to them, the question then becomes for any social entrepreneurs in this room or elsewhere, what happens to the other 99%? And remember that each social enterprise or social entrepreneur started first with one or two co-founders with, with an idea to change the world, whatever it is that they frame it, 
And they initially started off with funding from uh, friends, family, and fools, for example. And they get funding from philanthropists and venture philanthropists, what have you. Are we actually too caught up with the hammer of impact investing and forgetting the fact that if we have this startup forum and the title and the theme is transformational change, if we want to have transformational change that leads to development of economies, of countries, what does it mean? It means support organizations, whether they're called nonprofits or social enterprise, as they scale up. And how do you support them through their scalability as they scale up their social impact and their own business model? So there are appropriate funding mechanisms and tools of which angel investing is one, crowdsource is another, microfinance and what have you. There are many other tools. And so in a way it is a bubble, but it's good that people are highlighting the importance and the, and the promise of uh, impact investing, but let us not forget that social entrepreneurs in the early stage and middle stage, they need other sources of funding beyond impact investing. So this distinction is very important for their sake and for the sake of impact investors who finally open the door to say, hey, you are not actually scaling financial impact, you are scaling social impact, please go to your uh, philanthropists. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna pop another question. Got an eye on the time. I want to make sure you get out in time for your, your lunch. Um, they want to stand between a crowd and Mumbai and their lunch. Um, the next question I've got is really how can we leverage, um, if we think about India and think about East and Southeast Asia, um, I think it's become very clear in all these discussions that we've had in the convenings you know, in Bangalore and, and in Hong Kong that there is a sense that. East and Southeast Asia are kind of, you know, still at 1.0, still trying to kind of build an industry that doesn't really exist yet to sit its point in Thailand, you know, what is the industry? Um, so one of the questions that always comes up is, what can we learn, what can we, le we leverage from India, right? Which has had this very active, vibrant ecosystem and community here. Are there assets and networks and capabilities that we can leverage from India for East and Southeast Asia? Are there things that we can learn from what we did well and what we didn't do well in India that we can apply to East and Southeast Asia? It'd be great to hear any thoughts on that. So, so I'll, 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 I'll start the discussion, Harvey, on that. Um, I, I think, yeah, India has probably had almost 10 or, or more years of experience in, in what's called as impact investments. And, but, you know, I, I you know, personally believe that impact investment is, is nothing really radically different from investing in, in early, scalable, good businesses. Um, so from that perspective, you know, you, you, there, are, yeah, there are several things that you can sort of take from here or several things you can sort of leverage uh, from our experiences here. And that essentially means that you're sort of crunching the time between you know, investing in the result that you want to see and, and the development outcomes that come out of this. And rather than waiting for 12 or 15 years, you probably may be able to see this in five, seven years or, or even less. And, and I think that's, that would be the, the ideal scenario. And, and, and there are enough, I mean, the, the fact that we are always looking for scalable enterprises, the fact that unless we have commercially viable, scalable enterprises, uh, and, and, and we use that as a filter first. Personally, that, I think that's, a, that's the first filter that I would use, um, is one experience that we can sort of take back. The fact that it's not just a question of just investing, but also sort of being engaged with the entrepreneur in the business, but not necessarily running the business, but being engaged in terms of being able to provide strategic advice, networking support, helping them refine strategy, things where you have sort of learned the hard way, I think is, is also very critical because you're also essentially helping these organizations at the appropriate time to actually be able to scale up and not really fail. And, and that becomes critical. And, and, and I think from my own experiences, having that kind of an engagement actually helps. And, and, but also important is the entire ecosystem that, that's built around the entrepreneur. You know, intermediaries, angel networks, other sources of capital, because it's not just you know, 
venture funds, but there are venture, you know, there are angel networks, there are you know, crowdsourcing opportunities, other platforms that are available to them, intermediaries. More importantly, advisors, consultants who typically tend to work in mainstream entrepreneurial networks are also equally important in the space. And, and again, I, I go back to saying, you know, do they come first and then the entrepreneur comes or because the entrepreneurial ecosystem is being built up, they also see opportunities and then start coming. And I think these are, these are some of the experiences I think we can leverage uh, from India. How systems have been built up, how Sankalp has actually developed into being such a huge platform and a forum, how other networks that we also have here, you know, I3N, which is the angel network we have here. How do you really leverage learnings from those and take them across to other geographies? I think is very critical. Yeah, I I remember early 2008, I started working for a startup company called the Indian School Finance Company in Hyderabad, which is uh, around and much bigger now. But early, early 2000, I, I want to go deeper into this ecosystem perspective, because early 2008, um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, was an incredible time to be in Hyderabad, India. Um, SKS is there and growing like crazy. Acumen Fund was setting up shop and, and growing. Um, these guys were not that far away. And Telecap was really starting to hit its stride. I mean, there were a bunch of very bright switched on people. And then there were a bunch of enterprises that were there and growing that you've never heard of because they no longer exist because they were unsuccessful startups. But I think, I mean, I think of the people who I would, you know, go out to drinks with at night in Hyderabad in 2008 and what those people are doing now. And we're almost all of us are doing something different in some other version, but working together very productively because you had an ecosystem of a bunch of people in the same place, working on the same thing, who are very tightly networked with each other. And as the sector grows and people disperse, these organizations work more closely with each other. I think that um, you know what you're trying to build in Hong Kong is some version of, of that. I think what you're trying to build in Thailand is some version of that. But um, I would say, you know, the half a dozen c companies that probably lost a lot of money and are no longer around in, early in the early days in Hyderabad. I don't think we can entirely call that a write-off because the people who got experience there are doing other things with more successful companies now. And, and those of us who are there all, all know each other. We work together much more smoothly. So I, I just think the churn of lots of things being tried in the same place at the same time really yields a result that's, that's difficult to monetize. Maybe this is the role of government, maybe this is the role of philanthropy. Um, that's not something that I can take to your LPs and say, you should invest in a bunch of companies that are going to go bust because it would be really great for Bangkok. Uh, but there, there is a huge, huge benefit just watching this ecosystem evolve over the last five plus years. I need to get my mindset. Too. Yeah, I mean, the other 99% the other that founder goes on and does something else that, that leads one of the 1% to be a rocket ship later on. Yeah. Um, so, so actually, that's, that's pretty much, much why I'm here. <laughs> I really want to learn. <laughs> and I love you, that Yeah. Um, <laughs>
to buy you that and, and, and feel like that thing. You know, this kind of thing, you know, there are a few people that, 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 that have done this. So what we are trying to do is try to make it important. <laughs> you know? So for them to have the expertise and it, together with the local partners in Southeast Asia and together with the relationship that they also bring, you know, like these people also have a relationship with different banks, normally in the US and Europe that are doing this maybe as a kid or something, I don't know. Um, but it can be extended to Southeast Asia. As well as I think in India, you know, you have things like Abhishka, Internet Cab, you have uh, Garmin Cattle, and so on and so forth. This whole ecosystem, the relationship these people have to the investor around the world, or like supporters around the world, whether uh, philanthropy or invest, uh, investment from, from other countries, this relationship can also be leveraged for Southeast Asia, you know, like when they're trying to, you know, like when you actually go to Southeast Asia, you bring the same kind of investor. I think that's, that's also great. Um, beyond that, I think South Asia, India also can provide a really interesting ground for innovation coming from Southeast Asia or East Asia. You know, for example, we, we, we work with, uh, kind of in partnership with uh, different uh, social entrepreneurs network in Korea, for example, and one of them is working on affordable hearing aids, right? And trying to make a new sheet and so on, you know, and then I got inspiration from Arabic. <laughs> so, you know, like, after he did the eye lens of hearing aids, somehow he did it, and, and the price Drop significantly in Korea, but there's no way he can actually further reduce the price at even without growing into mass production market that, that can be done like India or something, which we already have a BOP distribution kind of structure, you know, India or Bangladesh, for example. So this kind of business partnership can also be done. And I, I don't know, like, is this should be the role of impact investors? But I think it would be an interesting and fun role. And I, I really think that impact investors themselves should be. You know, as you mentioned, you know, like, you know, impact investment is part of an impact economy, if you like to say, right? So, in fact, I think impact investment as an industry is like a nail, right? And the economy of the enterprise is like the helmet. So, we should be happy to get our feet <laughs> to as a nail and, you know, make something happen on the ground, create an impact, like, boom, you know, then life is better. I'm losing the hammer of the nail on it, but I think it's becoming very clear that, that maybe, maybe the way to put it is, is that impact investors are not the only part of impact in their state. So it's a much more than it compares to you know. uh, Two points. Number one is what can we learn? It's a mutual learning. Uh, let's go back to the South South collaboration. Uh, India has 1.3 billion uh, population, China is about roughly the same. Uh, Philippines is 100 million, Indonesia is about 200 million. What we can learn and also leverage from each other is that because India is doing really well from the perspective of a social enterprise that doing really good things of addressing broader base and pool of beneficiaries, clients, or what have you, that learnings that you have uh, should and can be replicable and learned from uh, in China, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, what have you, and also other countries as well. So from a similar product perspective, there's a lot of learning that India can benefit from other countries as plus. When we benefit them, what happens? The social enterprise actually have an expanded pool of, uh, you know, of, of clients to serve. So it's a win situation, number one. Number two is, not, let's not focus not only on South-South collaboration, but also North-South collaboration. What do I mean by this? Hong Kong and Singapore are the finest house in Asia. And there's no reason why we cannot convert a lot of these institution investors, family offices, and the next generation philanthropists to see that, A, there are also pockets of social issues. If you really want to create impact, don't just go to your local community and support uh, a school or build you know, something which is not scalable. Here, who are part of Asia, and if you really want to think about donation, there are different ways that you can actually look at uh, Asia, Asia, including India. If you want to think about development, impact investing, scalable models, learn and understand more what's going on in India. And transplant their requirements
that in terms of their investment or donation parameters have them share to India, and that's where the mutual learning and the humility uh, uh, comes in. So that you can share, learn what matters to them, and they can hear what's actually needed on the ground from your perspective. So both sides are learning in lockstep. Five years, two years down the road, there will be an actual investment that will be coming in, and they will convert, and you won't be wondering, you know, you won't be um, misleading, neither, neither parties will be misleading, but at the same time, this mutual learning and battle will come in. But those two will not take place if not, if not with the uh, help of all intermediaries, and this is not self serving comment. I do believe that there's space for everyone, and it's important that all intermediaries in India collaborate with intermediaries in the Philippines, Thailand, Hong Kong, China, what have you, for real collaboration, sharing, and also transfer of what works, what doesn't work. We are already seeing pockets of government to government collaboration in Hong Kong with uh, Singapore, Hong Kong with uh, South Korea, Australia, what have you. But the point of the matter here is that government also want to do good. They know because the budget deficit and what have you, they have enough cash in their coffers, they need to collaborate. And that's where the, uh, uh, that's where the collaborative will come in. And number three is, I don't see any DFIs here, but DFIs, development of financial institutions, they play an important role linking in what they do with the Millennium Development Goals, but how does that get translated to private sector practitioners as well as the non-profit and social enterprise in the ground. The dialogue right now is not taking place. I do hope uh, that this will happen sooner rather than later, that the connectivity between what each player and what motivates them uh, will uh, take place sooner rather than later. Once that is in place, impact investors and such as are will be able to do their job properly. They don't have to explain what is it that they do, what is it that they don't do as well. Okay, we, I want to look at some questions now, but also we don't have that much time. So what I'm going to do is this. Um, we're going to take three questions together. If there are three questions, I don't know if there will be. Uh, two minutes back, I did not go. But similarly, remember what he said. He said it took you 18 months for Holly Park to I think people did hear what we were getting in as uh, a larger project. But I really want to understand from you how much time does it take for a proposal to be put across and for it to finally realize? That is my first point. The second point which I want to make is uh, do with the difference in impact investing and the normal investing which investors do. I, I know the meaning, but what I'm trying to say is that there has to be a different lens which the impact investors have to carry when they're doing investment. Looking at us purely a business proposition probably will not work. The gentleman from Avishar sir, what you were trying to say was absolutely right when you said that uh, when you measure things, you're looking more at social impact also. But there are a lot of intangibles in this social impact. How do you really see those uh, intangibles? How do you measure those intangibles as far as the impact is concerned? Because if you're not able to measure them, then probably uh, you get a very blurred vision when you try and consider the proposal which is put up to you. That's what I really want to look at. Are you purely looking at numbers? If you're not looking at numbers, are you looking at the impact and if the impact is not so measurable, so clear in terms, how do you go about deciding? Okay, thank you. So we have the question here, the gentleman in front. My name is Nitin. Um, I'm uh, involved in diabetes complication management, uh, something to do with healthcare. And uh, the ambiguity which I find is uh, when you talk about this uh, impact and commercial uh, kind of investments. How many X's uh, as a thumb rule is it that in commercial, these are the X's an investor was going to expect, whereas in the impact, these were the kind of uh, return in terms of X's they were looking at. That was one. 
Second part is that if I have a model which was going to be good enough for both the direction, is it that because you say you are an impact investor specialist, therefore you'll only be on one side then, or I have to create two separate organizations and one for the regular profitable uh, uh, concept and the other one is for the impact. So these are, and just one small question which remained was that, uh, is it possible that, to, uh, especially you're talking about Philippines, that uh, are there some PPP kind of uh, mechanism which are there in the healthcare? That somebody would like to use that as a means of having a tie-up and then comes an uh, impact investor and then trying to see in combination that uh, it could go forward. Let's see, three questions, okay, <laughs> right, one more. Yeah, thanks, my name is Shubhan Sen Gupta, I work for MFI in India. Uh, this is the first time I've attended Sankalp and quite, you know, excited with a lot of you know, energy and optimism uh, and the variety we see here. Uh, but let, allow me to, uh, you know, put some skepticism, brings forward some skepticism about what we call impact investment, which used to be social investment earlier, or I don't know, triple bottom line investment. Uh, how much can we expect really out of all this over the next five or ten years? as far as a developing country's economic growth is concerned. China grew, didn't depend on any of this. Uh, India's growth story, I don't think uh, this investment or the entrepreneur community has made much of a difference, uh, neither for the Southeast Asian countries. So uh, that doesn't mean things can't be different, they probably can be, but just to be a little more realistic, skeptic, cautious, how much can we really expect, or are we all actually riding on a, you know, some kind of a feel-good thing, and we all feel good about all that we do, but are we actually not so relevant for our nation's growth? No, thank you. And I think good, good questions for this panel. I'm sure we're all skeptics in private and sometimes skeptics in, in, in public as well. So let me just recap all the questions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let each panelist decide which ones they want to answer, that's quite a long list. Um, the, the first questions were around um, how long does it take for enterprises to, to really get uh, invested in, um, and whether there was a difference between impact investing and, and normal investing, and how do you see that? Uh, actually ties into the question also from the second gentleman around, do you need separate vehicles to do impact investing versus conventional investing? Uh, what are we seeing in terms of exit numbers and returns? Uh, question about Philippines healthcare and PPPs. And then the final point, which is, um, are we over the pudding here? Um, is this really going to have an impact on economic growth and how the country is doing? Awesome. Um, I want to start by answering the last question, our, our skeptical friend. Um, I, I think this is, if you care about making the world a better place, it has never been a better time to be alive. I, I am fully against your skepticism. Um, it, it has never been cheaper to start a company. It has never been easier to get talent cross borders worldwide. It has never been easier to learn from what they're doing in diabetes in India and apply it to, to Thailand. The, the spread of ideas are, are very, very simple. Uh, the fastest growing company in Bangladesh, period, it, the entire country, but including oil and gas, pick, all the sectors that we hate or something like that, um, is a company called Bcash, which is a mobile payment solution targeted at the very poor. They are going gangbusters. They're growing faster than MNCs. It is because they have figured out an exact service that serves a lot of very poor people so well that very poor people are willing to pay a percentage of every amount that they they pay for this this service because it changes their life so much. When you get that, and not this, this is not every you know this is the one percent. Not every venture is like this, but when you get this kind of solution that solves a major social problem that people think about every day, and not just an annoying problem like oh my current iPad games are too boring. Um, when, you, when you're solving really big problems and you solve them so well that people are willing to pay for them, it's it it's unstoppable. So I. I think that it's obviously way more complicated than I just laid it out, but it, is, it has never been a more exciting time to try and do this, do this kind of stuff. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll also probably you know, 
a <laughs> short comment uh, which I'm too tempted to make on the last question, Shubankar, and, and, I'm, and I tend to agree with, with what he said, that um, this is probably one of the best times uh, for, for impact investments or for social enterprises. Yeah, you may not necessarily see the same kind of impact. Let's take, for example, e-commerce. But if you really compare capital available to e-commerce versus capital available to social enterprises, it, it, it's very small. But then again, the impact that these enterprises would have had, quality of life, you know, probably you know, better drinking water, affordable health care, any of those, even if the impact may not necessarily be as big as e-commerce is, the fact that you've made one particular region, one particular state, community stronger, probably more efficient or happier, I think is, is immeasurable. And I think that's probably one of the best things that's happening now. And I think one of the trends that, that we are also seeing, and, and, and I'm talking only because I, I talk to LPs constantly, is the fact that there's a lot of interest from mainstream commercial institutional investors who invest in funds and also wanting to make an impact and wanting to see a difference in their investments. So I think this is probably early days yet, yes, but then again at the same time I don't think this is something that will not really have a huge impact. I, I think it will, but it may not necessarily be the same way, but it's something that's going to be sustainable. And if you want it to be sustainable, I think it has to be done in two ways. Now, coming back to the other questions that people asked very specifically on venture capital, Vatsalya is our portfolio company. We're very happy uh, with the way Vatsalya has grown. We have invested in them. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule on how long it takes for a deal to go. There are deals that we in Abhishkar have done in a matter of weeks, and there are deals that have taken a few months. And it all depends on the level of comfort that we as investors have with the business, the entrepreneur, the business model, the institution, the team, but also what the impact is. Because as I said, we at Abhishkar are not necessarily looking only at numbers, we are also looking at social impact. So we actually do a fair amount of work on the impact. And if we don't have a measurable impact, then we don't, then we don't invest. And the same thing goes for commercial returns too. So both of them have to be hand in hand available to us or we should be in a position to do it. Having said that, yeah, it takes, you know, few weeks to a month and anywhere in between. So I know some people will get a little frustrated because it's not being done fast enough. Some people are very happy to get done very quickly. But again, like I said, it's, it's a function of how comfortable we are, how ready the entrepreneur is, what the entrepreneur is able to work with us on, and how willing the market is. Yeah, thoughts on the difference between uh, impact investing and conventional investing, do you need different approaches, different vehicles to do it? I don't think you need different vehicles or different approaches. Um, I, I think what you need is to essentially be in a position to actually demonstrate impact and be in a position to measure it. And, and Avishkar has actually over the years been measuring this on, on, a, on an annual basis, on a quarterly basis. We report this to our investors. And, and for every investment we make prior to making the investment, we have social experts within our team who actually visit these companies actually talk to the entrepreneurs, talk to who the beneficiaries are, try and figure that out and also start measuring it. And we actually benchmark it and we actually track it over the period of the investment. So for us, that's really, really critical. And I think that doesn't necessarily mean you need to have a separate or, or, or separate avenue for doing that. Um, if we hit all of the other I mean, I, uh, I think, uh, maybe quick question on like what kind of percentage or in, um, return that the uh, impact investor is in South Asia? Um, I'm not sure. Everyone looks uh, at different numbers, but um, we, we used to have uh, like a small community, like around 20 something social investors in, in South Asia, and we kind of realized that each of us are looking maybe at average, there's like 15 to 20 percent returns. Uh, over a very long period of time. Which because most of them from India invest their own investors around five percent mostly. Uh, at least the early that most of them like maybe ten percent or something in between. Um, so to cover the cost. But um, but but that's also a big problem now because suddenly you know like people now start to promise that actual investor twenty percent return, which means they have to make probably like 
following, <laughs> which is strange, but yeah. yeah. So um, and also with respect to the last issue, like um, I don't know, like it really depends on like what do you mean by by impact, right? Uh, and also like what what do you mean is like significance, right? What kind of number you are tracking? If you tracking like the the GDP, you know, then we have always this. This has about whether the GDP is right or not, and so on. But if you track like the number of the people that got benefits directly from this kind of work, you know, that impact investor is actually uh, backing up, then, then I think you can see a lot of uh, improvement. Um, especially in Southeast Asia, you know, we are, we are very good in developing our economy. But if you look at the data, we are really bad at making the development benefiting everyone. So we, like Thailand, you know, in the past 30 years, we, we decreased our poverty from 20 million people to around 5 million people. But we increased the inequality a bit massively. Um, our Gini coalition is like skyrocketed, you know. So, and it's a very similar thing going on in Southeast Asia. So, which means like whatever normal economic thing might, might generate big numbers uh, in terms of money, but, but how much of that money or actually livelihood improvement go to the poor or like even in Thailand, you know, we have gigantic political crisis which would not go away because it's structural, right? So, so you know, even a, a lower middle income people can be benefited from all this uh, impact investment. So I think that's really important. Well, it's about GDP growth. Uh, for the PPP, uh, we can uh, speak uh, separately on that. Uh, more information on that one. Um, in terms of the legal entity, I think the, what's more important here at this point, it doesn't really matter whether an organization is incorporated initially as a charity or social enterprise. What really matters is that whatever name you call it, the scalability factor and the sustainability factor is a very important uh, question that any organization can think of. And secondly, when you scale, any organization who wants to scale up, the first question that comes to your mind is, am I scaling my social impact or am I scaling my business model and financial impact? Because how you answer that question will significantly determine eventually who would be your eventual funder. If you're scaling social impact, uh, having a barbershop of a uh, you know, dis disadvantaged uh, community from one barbershop to 10 to 100, there's no way an impact investor will uh, will invest in that because you know uh, it just doesn't work from a uh, from a cost of production perspective, training all this up. But if you're actually coming up with a business model that at some point will be competing with commercial, uh, you know, with other com uh, commercial um, service providers, then it's a very different model. Therefore, don't get caught up. The point is, don't get caught up with the tool which is impact investing. There are many ways to do that. Um, in terms of whether it's a buzz or not, whether we are as a flavor of the month or we're just you know, talking about nice things, the reality is that I think goes back to what Rock's point. If each of us care about transforming uh, the world or doing, you know, having a better world than we, you know, uh, we leave it, how we do it, whether we invest our time, money, or expertise, it really doesn't matter. And I think each one of us will. Uh, as long as that is a starting point, whether impact investing is a, a conduit or, the, or other means, that is not, uh, actually secondary. And Ross' point about now is a better time, I actually fully agree with him. Technology is mainstreaming uh, across the world, and it's actually reaching a lot of the base of the pyramid, the population that is otherwise not even possible. So how, in your capacity, are you able to leverage the technology to actually reach the very uh, poor, off, or, you know, uh, inaccessible community. There are a lot of opportunities right now out there. And the last point I want to make is that, based in Hong Kong, I receive a lot of CVs from people who are either ex-bankers, consultants, or lawyers, or what have you, or even people saying that from Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, we are doing, and not just the young population, but also people who have just the thought as a partner of Goldman and you know, BCG said, I want to do something more meaningful. I want to help out. I can help you out on Saturday. I can help you out on weekends. Just give me a project. I really, I really want to learn about the space. So the question is, given that most people want to learn about it, what do you do? Does it mean that impact investments are bad enough? There are people who want to do something really meaningful uh, with, with respect to their time, their money, and also their expertise. 
that is where the opportunity is. Uh, now is uh, such a, a great time for that. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we're at time. Thank you so much to our panelists for your thoughts today and for ending on such an optimistic note. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. I think I have some gifts for you. <laughs>